8.15 on Boxing After Dark. Back live at ringside now with HBO boxing analyst Max Kellerman. Max, I mentioned at the top of the show that uh, Terrence Crawford is already the number one 140-pound fighter in the world. His ambition is to become number one pound for pound. What's at stake for him here tonight? Well, he needs to continue to look spectacular against this level opponent because he has not yet been in a super fight type of fight against another pound for pound entrant. And what is this level of opponent? Well, Felix Diaz is a former Olympic gold medalist. One loss, a tough loss to Lamont Peterson in a close fight. Lamont Peterson, a very good fighter. That's his only pro loss. And yet still, this is considered, if not a mismatch, at least a fight in which Terrence Crawford is a prohibitive favorite. It's like the Cavs and the Celtics. It's not necessarily commentary about the level of his opponent. He has a credible opponent. That's how good Terrence Crawford is. We've run into this with Triple G and, and Lomachenko and other great fighters here on HBO, unless an Andre Ward is fighting a Kovalev, two super fighters in together. We expect we know the winner going in, and that really says more about the excellence of the A side here than it does about the credibility of the B side. The B side, Felix Diaz, is a credible opponent. Like many top athletes, Terrence Crawford chooses to train at high altitude. His most recent choice over the course of the past several years has been Colorado Springs, over a mile high. Nearby is one of the most difficult hiking trails in America, called Manitou Incline with vistas of Pikes Peak available on the trek. It's a formidable physical test. And recently, Crawford and his team made the journey. Let's take a look. The incline is a big hill with stairs. When I first got there and looked up, I was like, man, is y'all serious? Are we really about to go walk, walk or run up this thing? The incline is very mentally challenging and being that you got little stairs, you got big stairs, it's going straight up. So at times you, you ask yourself, like, man, am I going to make it? When I get to the top and you looking around, you take little pictures, the thing you're thinking about is getting down because you know it's a long ways down and it's cold up there. Me training in Colorado Springs and doing all the things that I've done to get to this point right now, of course it's going to help me. It getting my mind, my body, physically, mentally ready for Saturday. And that's what it's all about, is being 100% prepared for the fight. And now back live at ringside with world championship boxing expert Roy Jones. Held that number one pound for pound ranking for a long time in his career. Uh, Roy, the man who could upset the apple cart tonight is, uh, for Terrence Crawford is Felix Diaz. And when you look at his credentials, the one thing that sticks out in a big way, something about which you know a great deal, is that he holds an Olympic gold medal. All these years later, what does that still mean to him? Uh, well, Jim, it means that he has the experience already to do anything he wants to do like he's faced every level of boxing every type of fighter when you fight at the olympics you fight the best of the best from all over the world he's possibly fought the cubans the russians the americans he's seen the best of every style so there should be nothing that terence crawford can do tonight to make him feel uncomfortable he should have seen everything but the flip side of that is terence crawford already has a victory over one gold medal. It's a guy who's highly celebrated as an amateur uh, in Gamboa. Therefore, he has also seen guys with that type of experience, and we know Terrence Crawford can bring anything to the table that he wants to bring. And to give you a little bit more about Felix Diaz, we originate now a new World Championship Boxing feature called Four Questions. Here are Four Questions with Felix Diaz. You know, my upbringing in the Dominican Republic was difficult. My family was middle income to lower income. We didn't have luxuries. When I was 14, I was already working in a car wash because I didn't want to beg and I didn't want to steal. I would be either in jail or dead. When I won the Olympic medal, there was lots of celebration. 
But when I got back to my neighborhood, it was underwater. It was completely flooded. The river had overflowed and went into my home and took everything. Everything was ruined. It's something that's very emotional for me because my life hasn't been easy. Many people see me and think, oh, look at Felix. Felix is good. No, I've gone through a lot, lots of fights, lots of battles to be here. My father passed in 2014. I remember I received a phone call at 3 a.m. telling me that he passed away from a heart attack. It's something that really hurts to just think about because I had just spoken to him the night before. I do what I do for him, for my wife and for my kids. I have a lot to live for and a lot to fight for at this point. And now Felix Diaz prepares to make his way from the dressing room to the ring here in the big room at Madison Square Garden. As we mentioned, the only Olympic gold medalist ever from Dominican Republic. And Max uh, Kellerman, that feels a little counterintuitive. It's not all that far away from Puerto Rico or even from Cuba, for that matter. What cultural difference accounts for the fact that boxers from the Dominican Republic are sparse as opposed to abundant? I've been asking myself that question my whole life, Jim, especially growing up here in New York City, because there's a large Dominican population, just as there's a large Puerto Rican population and, and Cuban population, in fact. And yet, according to Diaz, it's because there's no support for it in terms of the infrastructure in, in DR, except that some of the best baseball players in the world come from DR, right? Like the Dominican All-Star team is probably as good as the American All-Star team. And, and an incredible thing when you think about the size of that country. For whatever reason, there is not the same passion for boxing on that island as there is in Puerto Rico and Cuba and throughout other parts of Latin America. His only loss, Roy Jones, was against uh, the highly qualified American Lamont Peterson on Peterson's home turf in Northern Virginia. But this was a close fight, which showed us a little bit about what Diaz might be able to try to do against Terrence Crawford. Let us know what he's doing. Well, he closed the gap on Peterson. He stayed very close to Peterson, who was taller and had longer arms. He made it very difficult with his counter punches on the inside. He was able to bob and weave a little bit to get under Peterson's punches. And he's fighting close quarters. Something that Peterson wanted to do, but that Peterson should not have elected to do with a shorter fighter. There you see him kept banging. He banged to the body, he threw good uppercuts. And it's the perfect fight for him and the wrong fight for Peterson because of the height advantage. He has out through and outlanded Peterson in the last two rounds of that fight, but Peterson was able to hold on for the decision victory, which some ringside observers felt could have gone to Felix Diaz. Instead, if it, that had happened, he would be an unbeaten fighter coming in tonight against the unbeaten Terrence Crawford. Roy Jones, the big moment now in a lot of Crawford fights is when does he turn southpaw? But tonight he's going against a southpaw body puncher. Will that affect his decision? What will he do? Well, you know, Terrence Crawford usually says he looks for that time, but to me, just knowing Terrence Crawford and how competitive he is, he'll want to come out right away and as quick as he can prove to the southpaw that he's a better southpaw than this guy who won a gold medal at the Olympics as a southpaw. So it's quite a mental edge for Crawford against another southpaw if he can make clear when he switches that he can out southpaw the southpaw. Without a doubt, that's how competitive Terrence Crawford is. Crawford's, you know, you think about the great switch hitters in history, you know, Mickey Mantle, Eddie Murray, Pete Rose, Bernie Williams, one of my personal favorites, um, center fielder for the Yankees. In boxing, it's Marvin Hagler. But Terrence Crawford seems on his way to being mentioned in that category of switch hitter. The way he switches up, Roy, is effortless. It seems completely natural. He can do it in the middle of a combination, and there hasn't been a guy since Hagler who's so natural doing it as Terrence Crawford. He's the only conventional stance fighter I've ever seen, guys, who gains power when he switches to southpaw. That's highly unusual. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape now for Terrence Crawford against Felix Diaz, and you are going to see some very marked numerical advantages for Crawford here. He gives, uh, he is, uh, excuse me, he's got a four-year age advantage against Diaz, but then look at this, two and a half inches taller, three and a half inches longer in the arm from the armpit to the end of the fifth. 
They both weighed in under the 140 pound limit. Crawford rehydrated up to 157. There's a small edge for Diaz. He rehydrated even more up to 161 pounds. Let's go to Michael Buffer for the official introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, from the world's most famous arena, Madison Square Garden, New York City, New York, USA. This is the main event of the evening. And it's all brought to you by Hall of Fame promoter, Mr. Bob Barham for Top Rank Incorporated in association with DeBella Entertainment. Sponsored by Tecate, born bold. 12 rounds of boxing. This is for the unified WBO, WBC, super lightweight championship of the world. Sponsored by Tecate, born bold. Sanctioned by the New York State Athletic Commission. WBO supervisor is President Francisco Paco Barcarcel, WBC. Supervisor ringside, Michael George, WBC President Mauricio Suleiman. The three judges scoring this bout, Glenn Feldman, Julie Letterman, and Steve Weisfeld. And inside the ring in charge of the action at the bell, World Championship veteran referee, Steve Willis. And now, the officials are ready, the fighters are in the ring, and they are ready. So for the thousands in attendance, and the millions around the world who wish they could be here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> Introducing first, Fighting out of the blue corner with his trainer, Joel Diaz, wearing black with red and gold. Official weight, 139.4 pounds. This Olympic gold medal champion now has a professional record consisting of 19 victories, nine wins by knockout, only one disputed decision defeat. He is the challenger, Thomas Caballeros, El Retador de Santo Domingo, República Dominicana. El Hijo de Oro, Felix Diaz Jr. And his opponent across the ring, fighting out of the red corner with his trainer, Esau Dieguez, wearing black trimmed with gold, official weight, 139.2 pounds. His record as a professional, a perfect one. 30 fights, 30 victories, 21 wins by knockout. He's a two-time world champion, the reigning, defending, undefeated, WBO, WBC, super lightweight champion of the world, the fighting pride of Omaha, Nebraska. Paris Bud Ladies and gentlemen, both received your instructions in the dressing room. I want you to obey the commands, protect yourselves at all times. Right now, over here, we're going to call everything under the letters. Okay. Over here, we're going to call everything under the letters, okay? Tap it up, let's go. Felix Diaz pulls the upset off tonight. Might be the biggest win in the history of Dominican professional boxing. Terrence Crawford is as special as he is. Roy, you mentioned it because he's next level competitive. He's one of the most competitive athletes in the world. There are stories about Michael Jordan, how he wanted to beat you at everything. That remind you of Terrence Crawford, at everything. He doesn't want to lose at everything and he turns everything into a competition. And you see he starts out southpaw already because he's fighting a southpaw, so you knew he wanted to come out and show the southpaw that he could beat him as a southpaw. That's that competitive spirit that you're speaking about, Matt. So tonight there's no switch, unless at some point he switches into a conventional stance. But he has started out in the southpaw stance where he has seemed to be most effective over the course of the last 8, 10, 12 fights. We've been covering him here 
on HBO. And in this stance, Roy Jones, long jab, very stiff, hard right jab. Pretty good little left hook to the body down there, but most especially the, uh, the right hook uh, upstairs and, uh, and that jab and uppercuts with the right hand. All those things, tremendous weapons for him in this stance. Yeah, and what you like about Terrence Crawford is you see already tonight that he's utilizing a jab because he's fighting a shorter opponent. So he turns right southpaw right away okay. and he's utilizing that beautiful jab to keep the opponent at bay. His competitiveness, Crawford's competitiveness, can come out in the ring as sadistic. You know, he seems to, he's one of the few fighters, Roy, you think of a guy like Roberto Duran with a very different style, the great lightweight and welterweight champ, who, who enjoyed inflicting punishment. And Crawford, as nice he is, as he is out of the ring like Triple G, and friendly as he is and approachable with fans, seems to enjoy punishing his opponent. I mean, it's the sport of boxing. That's what most real boxers should want to do. Most are, are uh, very much like the guy with whom he competed in 2014 for Fighter of the Year honors, Sergey Kovalev. They're both sinister in the way that they attack opponents uh, in the ring. Terrence Crawford fought 25 rounds in 2016 against three different opponents, Hank Lundy, Victor Postol, John Molina. He might have won all 25 of the rounds. He has caught him with a couple right hooks, not much on them, but showed Crawford he could touch him upstairs. Now Diaz manages to get inside Crawford's arms just a little bit. Crawford steps away, goes back to firing that jab. Watch your head. Break the back. Watch your head. Watch your head. But Diaz knows one thing. He knows that he has to get close in order to have any possibilities of landing anything big. He's not going to beat Terrence Look Crawford from the outside. And Terrence Crawford is doing a good thing, a good thing of letting him know that by keeping that jab on him and making him stay at a distance. See the CompuBox graphic at the bottom showing you that Crawford has already tripled the number of landed punches for Diaz in the round. Nice work. Just keep working like that. I saw, I saw you throwing that jab. We're working on Just throw it now, but give me the second hook longer a little bit. You can see keeping that hand right here. All right? Nice, nice. Keep working that jab. Keep working that jab. When you're going to get on the inside, you've got to work. Don't just go in and take the punches, bitch. Come on, man. He's got the jab. Take that jab away. Come on, let's go. Roy Jones, you mentioned how Crawford was using the jab early against a shorter fighter. He wound up throwing 49 jabs in the round, landing 10, somewhat reminiscent of the night that we saw Gennady Golovkin come in and throw 52 jabs in the first round against David Lemieux. But this is putting an emphasis where the emphasis belongs. That's exactly right. And that's guys who know how to make those adjustments right on the fly. They know who to do what against. This is what you like about top pound-for-pound pound fighters. They know how to make oh. changes and make things happen. Diaz caught him with an overhand no, 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 left. No, 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 and he caught Diaz no, no, with an overhand no, no, left no, no, as well. Steve Willis rules no knockdown, saying that Diaz was tripped as he went down. It was interesting to see Diaz land that left hand because Crawford has become such a tremendously effective offensive fighter, it almost obscures the fact that he's a brilliant defender. The first time we saw him in a brilliant defensive performance against the dangerous Bradis Prescott of Columbia, that's really the night that he stepped forward toward prominence in the sport. Yep, and he just landed a beautiful left hand on Diaz again. He did, and Crawford is usually hit heads. earlier in a fight a little more cleanly. Class tells over time in the fight game especially, and Crawford is one of those guys who studies his opponent. He'll have success early, but his opponent can sometimes also have some success early as Crawford's figuring him out, and then as the rounds pass, the difference in class tells. Work your way out. Work your way out. Don't hold it. Crawford I got, I got accumulates small advantages and notices 
weaknesses and exploits them. Notice that he tied Diaz up and carefully managed him along the ropes there rather than to get into a situation where Diaz could hammer his body. Yeah, why would you do that with a guy that's shorter than you? You know, his punching power is close at close quarters, so you give him what you want to give him, and you tie him up once he gets in his area to unleash. Don't allow him to unleash. Diaz's his eyes already swollen up a little bit. Good lateral movement by Crawford. Goes back to working the jab. He's already thrown 73 of them in the first couple of rounds. Hey. Right, stop holding, but they got that hold. The Diaz has a little mouse under that right eye from that left hand right there. When Crawford is in the far right corner, oh, as you look at the ring in this angle, the far right corner over by the ring post, when he's in that area, he's working right in front of his mother, who is sitting in one of the front rows. She's by far his biggest fan and his most demonstrative cheerleader. And I assure you, he would love to knock out Diaz in that corner. Oh, Diaz with another good little right hook on he the He got inside. in a good one. showing his rambunctiousness in round two. Crawford disciplines him a little bit. They jaw with each other at the end of the round. June 17 is the highly anticipated rematch between Andre Ward and Sergey Kovalev. In November, Ward won a controversial decision to take the light heavyweight championship. Now they meet again live on HBO pay-per-view. And if you want to learn more about Ward and Kovalev before their big fights, a big fight, I should say, including their takes on what happened in the first fight, Tune in to 24-7, premiering June 2. I, I want you to pick up, uh, pick up a little bit, all right? Here you see Crawford land a beautiful straight left hand over the top of Diaz's jab, right on the chin, doesn't get any better than that. Then Diaz bounces back, though. He's not giving up. He leads with his right hook off of Crawford's jab. Lands a beautiful right hook high on the jaw of uh, Terrence Crawford. Great exchanges by both fighters. J.C. Morgan. Seated at ringside, looking good, by the way. Seemingly back in perfect health. And it was great to see Tracy sitting very close to Jerry Cooney on that side of the ring tonight. Crawford very much the kind of fighter with a mentality where when Diaz has a little success, we were talking about Crawford's competitiveness earlier. Crawford wants to take the play right away, right at that moment, and it should lead to continued, continuing exchanges and a higher rate of more kind of intense exchanges as the fight progresses. Crawford putting a little bit of extra oomph on the jab here in round number three. Yeah, landing that right hook much more Work your regularly your than we've no, seen no, no, I got you. fighter okay. land the lead shot in the past. Against Crawford. Against Crawford. Yeah, but you don't often see Crawford in the left-hand stance right away with guys uh, because he usually starts out as, as an orthodox fighter. Then he turns southpaw, so they can't hit him with that lead right hook because he usually waits, fills him out, then he turns around. But with Diaz being a gold medalist as a southpaw, no, you no, knew no, he was going to want to come out and show that not only can I beat you, but I can beat you at your own game. Oh, good job. Yeah. Right hand. Right up the middle from Crawford. Diaz got in another quick right hook. Oh, good shot. By Hard Crawford. right hand by Crawford. Wow. Crawford's already made the adjustment where he's timing Diaz's right hook and countering with one twos knowing that Diaz will be vulnerable to them and his weight will be forward. Hard body shot by Crawford with the left hand. Now he throws that left hand upstairs and lands it. Crawford's accuracy going up now here in round number three. Making Diaz pay the price for coming inside. And for talking to him at the end of the last <laughs> round. Work your way out. Work your way out. These are two big junior welterweights. I mean, you saw the unofficial weight today. Basically, each 160 pounds. That's a middleweight because of the day before weigh-ins nowadays. 
fighters have a full day to rehydrate. And so here we have a middleweight fight contested for a junior welterweight belt. Out. Honestly, Helps to make out. boxing one of the most confusing Watch sports imaginable. Go, okay. Honestly, Diaz is a super middleweight. He's 161. He's over the middleweight limit. Yep. Uppercuts with both hands by Crawford. There's another one. Just missing over the top of the left hand. Another right hand uppercut on the chin by Terrence Crawford. Well, it's that time of the fight where Crawford figures his guy out and starts to really go to work. Set, set, set. Let's go. No, no, I don't want it. I need to work this. I need to work this. Felix, you're not doing anything. Felix, you gotta work, son. You're only going in, man, you're catching all his punches. Come on, man. You're taking all his punches. You're not working. We're not doing anything. You're letting him come in. You're letting him build. Don't let him build, bitch. Be explosive. PC Crawford. Counter with a straight left, followed by a beautiful right hook. And because he's so tall and elusive, he slipped the right hook coming back at him. Take that with you while I'm gone. <laughs> Brilliant. That's boxing. Swelling around the right eye of Felix Diaz. As we arrive at round number five, and Terrence Crawford is gradually amping up the accuracy and throwing harder shots. Let's take a look at what's happened in the first three rounds in the eyes of our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman. Harold? Okay, Jim. Okay, Jim. I got a three to nothing, thirty to twenty-seven. Right, wait, Terrence no, no, Crawford. No, 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 stop. Hey, stop you know, stop, Jim. Stop, stop, stop. Felix Diaz. No, no, no. no. I, I, Let's see what the referee has to yeah. say. When you hold him like that, that's going to happen. You know what I mean? When you hold him, you hold him like that, it's going to happen like that. All right. Well, okay. Felix Diaz is standing in the middle of the ring, getting the crap kicked out of himself. I, I mean, <laughs> he's got to start fighting. The guy in his corner at the end of round two that said you got to start working was telling him the honest to God's truth. He's got to start working. He can't stand there like this and let Crawford jab him to death with the right jab and then whack him with a, with a hard straight left hand. I mean, Crawford's moving nicely. They did all the good shots. The whole, the it sort of reminds me of the Molina fight again. Three to nothing, Terrence Crawford. And you probably noticed in Diaz's corner that his trainer is Joel Diaz, who made his name for a long time as the trainer of Timothy Bradley, operates out of the desert in California, out near Indio. And uh, Joel, along with his brother Antonio Diaz, have been preparing Felix Diaz for this fight. I saw Steve Willis, the referee, earlier warn Diaz for jumping in with his head, which he clearly did intentionally, but an experienced ref also told Crawford, when you hold him like that, he, you know, that's gonna happen. Good hook by Diaz. The only thing Diaz is not really doing that would help him a little bit more is he's not using a jab, and that's what Terrence Crawford is doing, which is enabling right Crawford out. to keep control of the fight. Well, that's good defense by Crawford on the inside, Roy, slipping those shots. See that jab right there? Putting, yeah, putting himself in the position where Diaz really can't land shots even on the inside. Another perfect uppercut by Crawford with the left hand. Got oohs and dahs from the crowd. The jab is keeping Diaz fighting behind Crawford, though. If you notice, everything that Diaz does is after Crawford does something like that. Yeah. And it's mainly because of that jab. But then Crawford slips the, the uppercut and the hook on the inside. Diaz is actually having his best success timing Crawford from middle go, distance. Go. Work out. Not really yeah. landing much once they're inside. But he's paying a price to get inside. And that's what's killing like that right there. That's what's really hurting Diaz the most. Work your way out, good. When Diaz was looking good in the late rounds against Lamont Peterson, it was in a phone booth fight. Ooh. He needs to get, as Harold Letterman suggested, he needs to get up into Crawford's chest to get inside his arms Ooh. to have a chance to really do damage in the fight. As long as Crawford can stand back here at arm's length, he's simply too good, too quick, too skilled for Felix Diaz. And there is the Crawford family in the front row. None of those was mom. Good job. Good 
but she's over there. Yeah. Now that head's got to come up somewhere. So just protect yourself. Cousin, cousin, no, no, no. Just protect yourself. Hey, make sure your defense is tight after your offense, okay? Hey, he's slowing down on that because I see you. He's stopping every, every move, okay? I need a little bit more better timing with the okay. speed, okay? Okay. Take that little half a step back when he come in and try to come over top or come with the hook or something. But stay low, all right? Good job. Fucking good job. I, I want you to start working on that hook. Remember the hook we practiced? With the, with the right hook. I want you to start working. He starts dropping that hand, so I want you to work. Here you see as Diaz tries to walk into Crawford. Crawford just leans back and throws a beautiful left uppercut right up the middle. Perfectly timed punch. Even when Diaz lands some of the kind of more noticeable punches as he times them coming in and the sweat flies from Crawford. Crawford's actually usually riding some of that shot back and Diaz doesn't have his weight behind it. Crawford lands some vicious short shots on the inside. Crawford, alone among top 10 pound for pound fighters, has two trainers in his corner. They are co-trainers. He sees them as equal. Esau Dieguez and Brian McIntyre. He spent time listening to both of them during the uh, between rounds period coming off of round four. Good right hand jab followed by I mean, counter over the top of Diaz's jab by Crawford. I think Roberto Duran had co-trainers for a long period at the peak of his career, but outside of him, Roy Jones, I can't think of another top fighter who brought two of them into the ring and treated them as equals. No, not many people can do that because uh, most people have one trainer and most trainers have egos. They don't really want to work with a second trainer, so it was kind of difficult for that to happen. Both Esau Dieguez and Brian McIntyre, Crawford's trainers, are relatively ego-free. They don't really care much about who gets the credit. They want him to win. Good hook here, hook bited by Crawford. And, and this is why you have to have a jab as a little man. If he were jabbing, it would at least force Crawford to try to keep his hands a little bit. But because he doesn't jab, Crawford just picking him apart. See right there, he just got his hands up walking forward. You're never gonna get to Crawford like that. You gotta have a jab. Yeah, if he slipped and jabbed on his way in the way tight Mike Tyson used to do on the way up, given his kind of short, stocky frame and quick hands, by the way, he'd be doing better. And I know a lot of guys may not know this name, but one of the best short jabbers ever was a guy by the name of Dwight Muhammad I knew you bring up I mean, he's just the best short jabber in the history of the game to me. Shorter than most guys and could out jab anybody. Good left hand by Crawford. Right, Muhammad Kawi, who was among that group of light heavyweights who provided tremendous excitement throughout the 1980s and climaxed his career with an unbelievable battle against Evander Holyfield in one of the last truly great 15-round fights. The last. The he last lost. great 15-round fight. And I mean a great 15-round fight. July 12th, 1986. That's when you realize that Evander Holyfield truly was the real but when you watch Crawford, the reason a lot of these fighters come to mind, though we were talking about Diaz in comparison just then, is because he's special. And Diaz is a really good fighter, and Crawford here has won every round, apparently, and by increasingly wide margins. Terrence Crawford is awfully good for a guy who did not make an Olympic team. Shakur Stevenson was the star of the American Olympic team in Rio this past year. And earlier this evening, here in the Garden, Stevenson had his second professional fight appearance, fighting just across the river from his hometown in Newark, New Jersey. He scored a first round knockout against an ill-equipped opponent. A showcase appearance for Shakur Stevenson. He's now two and go, has a brilliant smile, has a pretty sharp straight left hand. And then in the preliminary bout just prior to this one, Ray Beltran, after an odd first round in which he went down on a headbutt, produced that brilliant left hook that knocked Jonathan Maciello cold. And Maciello was taken out of the ring on a gurney with his head secured after his head hit the canvas hard when he went down off the Beltran knockout. Ray Beltran with his fourth straight knockout win as he pursues a lightweight title. Very impressive knockout. 
And by the way, we've just been told that Jonathan Maicelo has been checked into the emergency room, the trauma center at Bellevue Hospital, and we will await further updates from the doctors as to his condition. Crawford slips a punch and fires back four in return. Well, he's looking so comfortable right now, Jim. He's having everything his way, doing anything he wants to do, landing the uppercut coming in, making Diaz pay the price for everything, every mistake he makes. I mean, it just doesn't get any better than that, Jim. Yep, pretty typical of a Terrence Crawford fight in round six. It's target practice. He's selecting his punches as though looking at the menu and ordering a la carte. He's utterly relaxed while he does it. Listen, he's, uh, and by the way, Diaz taking some of these shots upstairs really well. Crawford landed a right hook to the body about 30 seconds ago. Might be a good idea for him to concentrate down there for a couple rounds, see if he can't get Diaz out of here. Crawford inviting Diaz to come closer, toying with him now, humiliating Diaz by making clear to him that he's unwilling to come into the area where he might be able to do any damage whatsoever. Crawford is, among other things, a master psychologist in there, Roy. Yes, he is. Very masterful psychologist, knows how to play games, to make guys make stupid mistakes, and then he capitalizes once he gets them to do that. And when I said sadistic earlier, I mean, he's a mean guy in there. 100%. I, I brought up Roberto Duran. Pernell Whitaker was another one of these all-time great lightweights. Had mean streaks in the ring. Won a knockout puncher in Duran. Obviously, Pernell Whitaker wasn't, but was just as mean. Liked beating the other guy up. Roy, you say that that's what you're supposed to do as a great prize fighter, but I remember instances of you waving the referee in so you wouldn't have to hurt your opponent, and only after the ref wouldn't come in did you shrug and knock your opponent out. Yeah, well, me and Muhammad Ali were a little bit different. We didn't have to really be that mean because we were that good, and we weren't a mean personality type guys. So it's like you have to have that mean personality, and you're right, Terrence Crawford does have that mean streak that Roberto Duran possessed. Sugar Ray Leonard was like me and Muhammad Ali. We didn't have, well, Sugar Ray was kind of mean, though, but only when we needed it. When you needed it. Yeah. He's mean all the time right there, That's uh, the difference. Crawford. That's the difference. Sugar Ray Leonard, despite the beautiful smile, had a serious mean streak. You better believe it. And it was very effective for him in the ring. You better yep. believe it. But only when he needed it. Ask Dave Green. Dave Boy Green with that left hook. Yep. Ask Donnie Lalonde who let his head come up too high and got hit right in the throat. <laughs> oh, good hey. July 15, Boxing After Dark returns with a triple header. Our main event features Miguel Burchelt against Takashi Miura. Also that night, Israel Corrales goes up against Robinson Castellanos. Castellanos coming off a big knockout win over Yuri Orcas Gamboa. And Bernard Hopkins, conqueror Joe Smith. Jr. faces Sullivan Barrera. Joe Smith Jr., the construction worker puncher from out on Long Island against Barrera. Two months later, it's the biggest fight the sport can make. Canelo Alvarez against Triple G, Gennady Golovkin. That's coming September 16, and it will be seen only on HBO pay-per-view. You're reserving too much. You're reserving yourself too much. What happened? Did he hurt you? No. So why don't you work? Come on. What happened? Okay, Let's go. Help it, help it. Ready, Let's go, bastard. He's playing with you. <laughs> Joel Diaz trying to motivate Felix Diaz. It's really interesting in our four questions feature before the fight that Felix Diaz gave that more or less standard answer that he would be in jail or dead if he had not become a fighter because his town in Dominican Republic is beset with serious social problems, and many people there have asked him to run for political office. How's that for a reversal? Harold Letterman, maybe you should run for political office. But first, tell us your unofficial score. Okay, Jim, I got it six to nothing. 60 to 54, Terrence Crawford. You know, Jim, his fast hands are just murdering the ears. It's amazing. The guy is so quick. Got that, I, I put him a Terrence Crawford. Got that hard right jab, that fast left hand, that un incredible uppercut. Look at that. He threw a right jab and snapped the ears his head back. He's doing such a good job with those punches. Landed punch after punch after punch. His movement is tremendous. Six to nothing, Terrence Crawford. Yeah, talk about a toolbox. What doesn't Terrence Crawford have in that toolbox? The jab with both hands, southpaw and orthodox. Oh, big left, left hand, hand by Diaz. Diaz. 
Best punch in several rounds. Not a good might have gotten a little too casual here. Diaz has come alive in round number seven. He waked himself up with that one big shot. And now is Crawford's confidence and competitiveness is, you know, hubris here. Will he try to prove to Diaz that that shot did nothing to him and open himself up for more shots? He just did by landing a good left uppercut to show Diaz that he's not as hurt as bad as it looks like he is. Diaz actually is the worst for the wear. Crawford landed the better shots, but was shooken up temporarily by that right hook. Crawford talking to Diaz as they go shoulder to shoulder in there. Diaz with the left, and Crawford with another sizzling right hook. A sizzling body shot, that's what caused the oh, problem. Oh, those body shots from Crawford just then. And right when you think you got him hurt, he attacks you with bigger punches. Uh, these are the exchanges I was talking about earlier in the night. Diaz eventually hits Crawford. Crawford wants to come right back, and you get this. Well, you well this is Diaz's best round in the fight. And if Crawford follows his career pattern, Diaz will pay a price for having scored as well as he has here in round number seven. Well, he's paid the price. Now the question is, can he make Crawford pay an even bigger one? Crawford seems to me to be the kind of fighter, Roy, where you're going to have to separate him from his senses with one shot to get him in a fight like this. He's not going to just let you take the play away. No, he's not. Not at all. And he's smart because he remembers to go to the body. Right when you get him, when you think you got to hurt, he remembers to go to the body. Most guys don't. I love to watch Steve Willis plant himself right at the epicenter of the action where he has the closest view the referee can get. How are you? Breathe. Hey. Let me work. Let me work. Felix. 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 Felix, come on. You heard him. You saw You saw you could do it? Okay. Now tell me you understood. You understood you have to work. So let's go. You got to press. You got to work. You got to work. PC. Diaz come back out the cover, try that right hand, left hand, right jab again. He counted with a beautiful overhand left. Best punch he's been able to land all night. He still paid a price to land the punch, but he did sacrifice and, and get something back after getting caught with that right jab. In that seventh round, Felix Diaz landed a fight high 16 punches. He threw 63, his largest number thrown in the fight. Crawford was 18 out of 46. That was a heck of a round for both fighters. Well, you saw that stare down at the end of the round. That was a world champion and a former Olympic gold medalist competing against each other, neither wanting to give an inch. That's when you get that special kind of action. Funny now that you see the fight has changed. Terrence Crawford is now the stalker. He's the taller guy who should be outside just boxing, and the short guy, Diaz, should be doing the stalking. But now Crawford is stalking because it's championship time to him. And plus the fact that he got caught with a big punch last round. Oh, good left hand counter by Crawford. Great combination by Crawford. While they continue to fight here in round number eight, we'll once again update the Jonathan Maciello situation. We have been told by people who are in the emergency room at Bellevue and can see what's going on that Maciello is conscious and communicating with doctors. It appears that he is being treated for a concussion, but nothing more severe than that at this point. Crawford really landing some heavy shots in this round. Yeah, that was that right jab again. It's, and, and the difference in this fight, as is usually the case, when you have a fighter on Crawford's level versus a level below, is Crawford's able to land combinations precisely upstairs in the middle of the ring. Not just one shot at a time, but three and four. Diaz, when he has success, it's generally with a right hand. And then Crawford's, ab Crawford's able to cover. When referees become enormously popular in boxing, 
it isn't necessarily always because they are great referees, but because they have something in the way of a personal style that's entertaining to watch. Steve Willis is as entertaining to watch as any referee currently working in boxing. And the level of his assignments tells you that the New York State Athletic Commission also believes he's a very good referee. But he's highly unusual in his intensity, the way he positions himself, the facial expressions that he brings. He's involved in the fight much more than some other referees appear to be. Yes, but that's all based on a foundation where he makes good judgment. Judgments, you know, he, he shows his discretion, his, his, his judgment is sound, almost always. Good right hook from Crawford. Oh, that hurt him. That yep. hurt Diaz bad. Yep. Good body shot by Crawford. One or two more of those to the body, Roy. Yes, I think he's yes. more hurt oh, by that left that. hand yes. to the body. He is, Max. He wants to go down for that body shot. Oh, good hook by Diaz. Competitor. Willis wraps his arms around Diaz to protect him from one more shot after the bell. You're looking at Julius Ndongo. Julius Ndongo is from the nation of Namibia in Africa. And within the past year, he has scored two stunning upset victories to capture the other two 140-pound title belts. By other two, I mean that Terrence Crawford has two 140-pound title belts because Ndongo has now collected the other two. Crawford, if he chooses to fight Ndongo, would have a chance for a rare feat in acquiring all four of the belts in the division. It hasn't happened since back in the day in the middleweight division when Jermaine Taylor took all four belts away from Bernard Hopkins. And Roy be, Jones? And he'd be one step close with landing beautiful uppercuts just like that. That really hurt Diaz. I think Diaz's knees are starting to weaken, or legs are starting to weaken a little bit now. That was a beautiful, picture-perfect left uppercut while Diaz was coming in. So just to make the point, Ndongo is here because Crawford and his promoters are looking at the possibility of fighting Ndongo and trying to acquire the other two belts in the 140-pound weight class. And Max Kellerman, it happens so rarely in boxing, it would be another feather in Crawford's cap. Yep, the belts are still important to the fighters. And um, I would say for people to, oh, good left hand from Crawford. Diaz in trouble again. Diaz was in trouble a couple times in the last round and again here. I would say you think about boxing with the belts the way you would think about college football before the national championship game over the last several years, which was which is which is to say that it's like winning a bowl game. It doesn't necessarily mean you're the best in the division, but it's a nice thing to do. And of course, if you could somehow win all the bowl games, there would be very little doubt that you're the best in the world. One of the things that makes Canelo Triple G such an enormously attractive fight and important for the sport is that Canelo still holds what is called the lineal middleweight championship, while Triple G has three belts. Meaning, the lineal meaning he's the man who beat the man who beat the man. And that man was Miguel Cotto after Miguel Cotto beat Sergio Martinez. And it was an oddity because really, Martinez, Cotto, and Canelo Alvarez at that time, all three were basically 154-pound fighters functioning in the middleweight division. And to your point about lineal, and this, this looks like it could be coming to a close before too long, the way Crawford's dishing out this punishment. Martinez beat Pavlik, who beat Jermaine Taylor, who you mentioned, beat Bernard Hopkins, who'd beaten everybody. Diaz has thrown only eight punches now here with a minute and 15 to go in round nine. So he's slowed down considerably in the last couple rounds. Roy, you made the point in the last round that that big shot may have been the beginning of the end for Diaz. And now Crawford is carefully selecting the power shots that he lands to try to bring this to the close. Yeah, because Diaz is 161 pounds. He's still dangerous and he's very heavy. So Crawford is very smart. You can't just run in there on any kind of way. A dangerous animal is a very, a wounded animal is a very dangerous animal. So I don't think the animal can see so well either. He it's, can't. And Crawford's taking advantage of it. And as Steve Willis showed in the Gennady Golovkin David Lemieux fight, he won't allow the punishment to continue just for the sake of spectator appeal. He will protect fighters from unnecessary damage. And right now, they managed to protect Diaz from himself. But he's taking a pretty bad thrashing here. Yeah. There's he has trying to put up one last burst, going hard at Crawford as he came out of the corner. Ten seconds to go in round nine. It's been a really rough one. 
for Felix Diaz. See what Diaz's corner has to say in between rounds. Well, on June 17, it's the highly anticipated rematch between Andre Ward and Sergey Kovalev. In November, Ward won a controversial decision to take the light heavyweight championship. Now they meet again live on HBO Pay-Per-View. And if you want to learn more about Ward and Kovalev, including their takes on what happened in that first fight, tune in to 24-7, premiering June 2. I don't want you to get hit. We can't win the fight this way. If you don't, if you don't show me that you can dominate this round, okay. I'm going to stop okay. the fight, okay? Okay. There's no need to take so many punches. Bastards, come on. I told you already. Hey, we're down. Here you see Crawford in a beautiful overhand left at the beginning of the round. That took all the fight out of Diaz for that particular round, I think. He backed up right there, didn't seem to want no more action. That shot hurt him pretty bad. But Diaz is very game. I got to say, I understand why his corner would send him back out. But to tell you the truth, it's not necessary. There's no point. Oh. The, the athletic contest has been decided. And it's Coming. possible he does something miraculous, but so unlikely that it's probably not worth the risk here. And when you see him come out moving backwards like that, it lets you know that he doesn't really think he can do anything miraculous. Terrence. The doctors made a decision that he can see, so therefore he can go back into the ring. But Harold Letterman, he's got no chance to win. No chance. Not to nothing, 90 to 81, Terrence Crawford. And in the ninth round, I'm telling you, the guy wanted to quit the entire three minutes. They should stop the fight. Yeah, Crawford, you know, they're, they're fighters. You mentioned Bernard Hopkins. Jim, who accumulated small advantages like a chess master throughout the fight, and they added up throughout the fight to a wide win for, for Hopkins. Crawford does that, but more than that, he studies his opponent, figures out exactly how to beat him up, and after a couple rounds, just starts to beat the hell out of him, and that's what happened here tonight. Well, he's more aggressive, and he punches more, uh, his punches are much more powerful, pound for pound wise, than Hopkins' punches were. Hopkins beat you up, but nothing was going to one punch knock you out like it, that. It's not just that Crawford accumulates small advantages. It's that he figures out how to exploit big ones, and he does it, you know, before even the middle rounds begin. Uh, if he has had more devastating one-punch power, that would be more merciful. He beats fighters up, breaks them down, ruins their careers. He got one-punch power. This guy's 161. That's why he's taking it. If he, was in, if he was 140 or 145, he would be down, too. Yeah, here's another scary thing about Crawford. As he's risen in weight, he's shown increasing power. You know, the question is sometimes, does a fighter take his punch up with him in weight class? He's, he's now humiliating Diaz. And Steve Willis basically says to Crawford, look, you don't need to humiliate him like that. Fight straight up. But, but Crawford has, it's not just that he carried his punch up, it's he's actually a better puncher in a higher weight division. When you see a guy who has the proper technique, Max, no matter how much weight he gains or loses, he's still going to be a proper, a, a great puncher because he punches with proper technique. Uh, Terrence Crawford is one of those guys that has the proper technique right. from the right. left side and the right side. And so the additional weight, he Only must, he must be killing better. himself to make 135 pounds. Of course he was. We saw that. He can make 147 right now, as we see. He's 157 tonight. The, the additional weight means his physical strength comes out and increase, you know, with a good technique. Felix Diaz has landed up. only four punches in this round. It was pointless to send him back out here. Other than to further shorten his career. Oh, good shot by Crawford. Oh, oh, oh. Felix Diaz is one game fighter, though. He's not quitting. They're, they're not going to let him out for the next round. And there's the stern look on the face of the Diaz family. Yeah. As they stand at ringside. And now Joel Diaz waving the white towel. And we're done. Technical knockout victory for Terrence Crawford at the end of round number 10. Guys, Lamont Peterson's a good fighter. Diaz had a really tough fight with Peterson. That's Diaz's only loss. Diaz won a gold medal. And 
had a competitive spirit and landed a few shots early, but was no match for Terrence Crawford. Who is? In the 140-pound weight class, there isn't anybody. Everybody wants to see what happens when he moves up to welterweight. First, he might fight Julius Ndongo to get the four belts in the 140-pound weight class. And then if he can do that, maybe he goes to welterweight. People are still talking about the possibility because they share a promoter of a fight with Manny Pacquiao. I don't think that Pacquiao is going to be any more eager to fight Crawford after what took place here tonight than was the case in the last several months leading into this when the possibility existed for, for Pacquiao if that's what he wanted to do. He's choosing to fight a guy named Horn in Australia instead. I agree, and I think Crawford would be favored, but Pacquiao remains, even though he's not what he once was, a tremendous matchup for anyone. Even Floyd Mayweather admitted he had his hands full, and that was a very difficult fight for him. So that would be a tremendous matchup, Pacquiao Crawford. Well, Crawford certainly wants it. He has an ambition to become the number one pound for pound guy, and that would be exactly the kind of name you want to get onto your resume. In the last three rounds, Terrence Crawford landed 63 out of 98 power shots, and really, Roy Jones. He could have amped the volume up and done even more damage. He was selecting carefully those shots that he knew he could land. He was being smart about it because the guy's 161 pounds. You don't want to run in on a super middleweight and you're a dream, a dream, what, a dream lightweight, a dream welterweight, and just give up big shots. So um, he did a smart job of taking his time, using his accumulation of punches to the head and to the body to weaken the opponent, and then slowly just let, let things come to an end. Don't go try to push the envelope too much and give yourself up or give up a big shot. 31st consecutive win. That's his mother over here to the right of the screen uh, in the black and white. Deborah, she's the number one fan. 31, uh, 31st consecutive win, 22nd knockout. His skill is still amazing and his power seems to be increasing with each passing fight, and this is the end. Yeah, that was a good shot to the throat, followed by a beautiful right hook, followed by another left hand, straight left hand, followed by another right hook to the top of the head. He just was landing too many punches. Joel Diaz realized that and just called it off. Crawford fought the entire fight in the southpaw stance. That's the first time we've seen that. But I told you in the beginning of the, of the fight, before the fight, that fighting a guy who won a gold medal as a southpaw was going to lead Crawford with his competitiveness to want to go out and show this guy that I'm better than you as a southpaw fighter. Let's go to Michael Buffer for the particulars on the TKO. Ladies and gentlemen, here at Madison Square Garden, the challenger's corner indicates they can no longer continue. Referee Steve Willis calls a halt to the bout. Officially at the end of round 10, the winner by TKO victory and still unified WBO, WBC, super lightweight champion of the world, the fighting pride of Omaha, Nebraska, USA, Terrence Bud Final copy box numbers. Crawford landing 124 more. Throwing nearly 200 more. Landing at a 37% overall connect percentage, which is very high. And limiting Diaz to a 20% connect percentage, which isn't high. Power shots. Crawford landing 81 more. Throwing 50 less. 59% of your power shots? That's freaky. That, that is just absolutely freaky. You don't see that number. And holding Diaz to 20% of his power shots. It was a route. It was a route in which Diaz had a few interesting moments. But all in all, it was a route because of the extraordinary talents of Terrence Crawford, who stands by with Max Kellerman right now. Congratulations, Terrence, on a performance that we've come to expect from you. When you go up against good fighters, it seems to be no contest. But this guy started out with a little more competitive energy, it seemed, early in the rounds than some of your opponents recently. Did you come out as a southpaw to prove to him that you could beat him as a southpaw? Why did you come out left-handed? Well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank God for blessing me with this victory. 
and I'd like to dedicate this fight to my aunt that passed away, Bonnie Davis. Love you. And I came out Southpaw because I do what I want in there. This is my ring. Because he's a Southpaw, you wanted to prove to him that you're better than him as a Southpaw. Because that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> we were, I was talking ringside and said that that you and I compared you to some great lightweights of the past. I know you're a junior welterweight now and soon probably a welterweight, but Pernell Whitaker, Roberto Duran, you're a mean guy in there. Like you enjoy beating the guy up in a way maybe not all prize fighters do. Am I right about that? Why is that, Terrence? It's a fight. Can't be nice in there. My dad always taught me as a little kid, don't go in that ring playing, you're gonna get hurt. So you gotta be mean in there. We see that normal really good fighters really don't provide you with competition. At least they don't push you. You need to be in there with another super fighter. Who do you see out there when you survey the landscape at 140, 147 pounds, do you think makes a big fight with you where you will be pushed? Pacquiao. That's the only fight out there that we really looking for. If not, Ndongo here, he came to my fight. Let's get it on, Ndongo, wherever you at. <laughs> Keith Thurman, whoever, let's go. I move up and fight anybody. Do you think Pacquiao at this stage in his career is likely to fight you? Who knows? Hey, that's not up to me. I'm a fighter. That's up to my promoter, Bob Arum now. He got a fight that he's preparing for right now. So he's more focused on this fight than anything else. Like I said, I'm just blessed to get the victory and be here today amongst everybody. In boxing, unfortunately, the case is nowadays, a lot of times, when you look the way you look, the super fights don't materialize right away because the other fighters don't want it. So you have to fight a certain level of opponent and look the way you do to make the case for yourself. In a pound for pound conversation, your name keeps coming up and rising. Is that important to you to be considered one day the best pound for pound fighter in the world? Of course, that's what we all do it for. That's what we bleed, sweat, you know, put our life on the line for is be remembered in the sport of boxing. Thanks, Terrence. Look forward to seeing you real soon. It's for my boy, Bernard Davis. Happy birthday, Sandy. Jim. Another celebration at ringside for the Crawford family. And meanwhile, Diaz has left the ring and makes his way back to the dressing room after a humiliating beating at the hands of the truly great Terrence Crawford. And now Roy Jones at ringside, and uh, Max Kellerman did a pretty good job of discussing all of the possibilities with him. First of all, uh, you know the mentality of truly great fighters. Do you think that Manny Pacquiao, at this stage of his career, would still consider fighting a guy like uh, Terrence Crawford? Of course he would. Uh, Manny Pacquiao is a guy who's also just as competitive as Terrence Crawford. Manny Pacquiao has looked good in, in his last fights you know, as we've seen him. Um, he still has a little bit left in the tank. He's definitely a competitive type of a guy. Um, so he would gladly welcome Terrence Crawford in the right kind of situation. Now, if it's not the right situation, then why should he fight Terrence Crawford? But if it's great money and it's a great opportunity for him, of course he'd welcome that fight. Sounds like the next fight we might see would be Julius Indongo of Namibia. And that's a chance for uh, Crawford to get hold of all four 140-pound belts. But at 147, and he mentioned some of the names, you have Keith Thurman, you have Danny Garcia still, you have Errol Spence and Kell Brook. There's a lot of talent at 147. Does Crawford qualify right now if he moves up to fight any or all? Yeah, he qualifies to fight one time. One time basically has risen to the top of that division uh, in my eyes because He's beat the best, who was Danny Garcia, who I thought it was him or Danny, who were the rulers of the 147 division. So with Floyd being gone, one time is the ruler, and he's the ruler at 140. Why not put the two rulers together? That's what boxing is all about. That's what we do. So a real fighter wants to go up and fight the next real fighter. And like I keep telling people, real fighters don't look down, they look up. He's not looking for guys under him. He's looking for guys above him. You don't prove a point by beating the little guys. You prove a point by beating the big guys. And for any who don't know, one time is Roy's fellow Floridian, Keith Thurman. 
uh, from Bradenton. Max Kellerman, your final thoughts on this brilliant performance by Terrence Crawford. Well, and by the way, respect to Keith Thurman, who's earned it. But I suspect that the best fighter at 147 pounds, the special fighter, is Errol Spence. We'll see against Kell Brook. Um, if that's the case, I suspect it is. I also suspect that Terrence Crawford is a great fighter. We won't know for sure until he's in with another great fighter, but I suspect we're watching a great fighter in his prime, and that's really something to see. And the defining characteristic above all things for Terrence Crawford, I think, is a defectively competitive personality. We see it in all sports. Um, Kobe Bryant in basketball, more than anyone, probably Michael Jordan, someone who needed to compete with everyone at all times in everything and make competitions where they didn't even exist. That's Terrence Crawford's basic personality. He is defectively competitive. And I think it makes him, I suspect, it makes him a great fighter. And I can't wait until the day where he can prove that in the ring against someone else as special as he is. And one ritual that most great fighters go through at some point is to appear here in the Mecca of Boxing, Madison Square Garden. So Terrence Crawford tonight came to New York, appeared in the big room at Madison Square Garden for the first time, drew a larger than expected crowd, and showed them what has become his typical performance, a performance in which he goes into the ring, sizes up the opponent, spends a few rounds getting comfortable with what he thinks he can do, and then produces vicious punishment, which separates him from every other fighter in his weight class. We look forward as we have for the past few years to seeing what he does next. And thanks for being with us on this Madison Square Garden edition of World Championship Boxing. There's a lot coming your way in the upcoming months from HBO and HBO Pay-Per-View. Tuesday, it's the next Real Sports. In June, we have 24-7, The Fight Game, plus the much-anticipated Ward Kovalev rematch. Coming in August, five episodes of Hard Knocks with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And just announced, the boxing world gets its next super fight. Canelo Alvarez against Triple G, Gennady Golovkin. We can't wait for that matchup. Now for everyone here at Madison Square Garden in New York City, I'm Jim Lapley saying so long and thanks for watching. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.